Uh, thank you, Dr. Mann, for being with us, uh, and please, uh, you can start. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Gabala, for, for your introduction. It's really a pleasure and honor to be with you today. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Assayas and the organizers for this opportunity to be with you. It's an honor to be with you here, and uh, we'll talk about pancreatic cancer, any changes on the treatment and management. Uh, I'm going to share my screen in a second. Great. So uh, the outline for my talk is going to be uh, talking about a little bit of background risk factor. Then we're going to go over treatment updates stage by stage for pancreatic cancer. We're going to highlight the new adjuvant therapy, adjuvant therapy, and some changes in the palliative therapy. And we, if we have time, we're going to go over a few uh, future direction on the management of pancreatic cancer. So uh, pancreatic cancer last year. It was estimated 56,000 new cases to be diagnosed, which account for 3.2% of all cancers. The death was estimated to be 45,000 cases, which is estimated about 7.5% of all deaths uh, related to cancer. If you looked uh, at the bottom of the slide, you see like the new cases and the death lines, they are barely separated, meaning that this is a challenging disease and more need to be done to get these lines separated and save more lives. Five-year survival for pancreatic cancer is around 9% from the data from 2009 to 2015. It's the 11th most common cause for cancer. However, it is the fourth leading cause for cancer-related mortality. It's come after lung, colon, and breast for women and prostate for men. It was expected that by 2030, it will be the second cancer killer. Pancreatic cancer is called a silent killer because by the time the symptoms appear, patients you already have at an advanced stage. Lesions at, uh, at the head of the pancreas usually present with jaundice, while lesion on the body or uh, head or the body of the, of the pancreas present with pain because it's pushing on the mesenteric plexus and splanc plexus. And that's the typical presentation is epigastric pain with some radiation to the back. Lesion in the tail usually present with constitutional symptoms related to the metastatic disease. And it was estimated 5% would present with acute pancreatitis. This risk factor is known to us. Uh, environmental factor which account for 25%, including smoking and pancreatitis. Metabolic factor uh, account for another 25%, including obesity and diabetes. Genetic with familiar pancreatic cancer and hereditary syndromes are known risk factors. In addition to the mucinous pancreatic cyst that include MCN and IPMN. We have some control in the first two risk factors. However, we have no control in the genetic and the mucinous pancreatic cyst. As we know, 10 to 20% of pancreatic cancer presented as resectable. On the other hand, 30 to 40 percent of cases present with local advance and resectable, and the rest and the majority of cases presented with advanced metastatic stages. And we recognize over the last 10 years a new clinical stage called borderline resectable that for patients who are not resectable now but can be changed to be resectable once we give them some kind of a treatment, quote unquote, a new adjuvant therapy. The surgical section is actually is the only uh, potentially curative treatment with survival improvement. However, the improvement is we're talking about less than two years. On the other hand, most patients are diagnosed with unresectable and metastatic stage with a median survival of a year. And you notice here from this diagram that chemotherapy is a corner or a, like, you know, a key part of the treatment of pancreatic cancer in all stages. This is a timeline where showing changes or approval of chemotherapy over the last 20 or more years on the palliative settings. 1996, gemcitabine was the standard of care. 10 years, almost 10 years later, erlotinib was approved 
based on clinical trial with statistical significance. However, clinically, it's not meaningful and we rarely use it in our practice. Five years later, Fortforinox was approved in 2010. And four years later, gemaproxene was approved or not paclitaxel. And actually this is it for the palliative setting. However, the changes on management of pancreatic cancer and the new strategies is actually been evolving for sub-patient population. For example, on the borderline resectable, the new adjuvant setting, there is some improvement in that regard. For this patient population, the treatment option include upfront surgery with followed by adjuvant chemo radiation or induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation and then surgery or induction chemotherapy and followed by surgery. And there's no clear data about which treatment is better than if the treatment or one route is better than others. ISPAC uh, 5F is actually a trial that presented in ASCO of this year, and it's highlighted some of these questions. In this trial, around 90 patients with borderline resectable pancreatic cancer were randomized to surgery or to chemotherapy with GEMCAB, basically gemcitabine and capcitabine, versus fulfurinox or chemotherapy with radiation and with uh, capcitabine as the radio sensitizer. And the dose of radiation is 50.4 gray. Patient will restage and then went for surgery and this is followed by adjuvant therapy. Some of the finding here that the estimated 12 months survival for patient who had surgery upfront was 42%, while for patient who have a new adjuvant therapy found to be 77%. So suggesting that those patients need to be treated with some sort of a treatment before they go into surgery. Further analysis, they found that, you know, patients who have GEMCAP, they have the 12 month estimated survival of 79%, while patients who have Fulfurinox have 84%. Compared to the patient who have chemo radiation therapy, they have a 64% of estimated 12 month survival. So you can tell that you know, there is benefit from giving those patients systemic chemotherapy, which is sound like maybe slightly better than just chemo radiation by itself. The another trial uh, called uh, PreO Bank uh, tried to answer the question where we comparing upfront surgery compared to chemo radiation with gemcitabine. This trial, patients were been randomized to upfront surgery and then followed by six cycle of adjuvant gemcitabine compared to patients who have a new adjuvant gemcitabine followed by gemcitabine with radiation in a sandwich style, followed by gemcitabine. And after that patient went to surgery and this is followed by four cycle of gem. The prelim data showed that, you know, the chemo radiation have a better median survival than radiation with 17.1 months compared to 13.7 months. However, later the data was matured and published and it was they shown that there is no uh, improvement overall survival for those patients who treated with uh, chemo radiation with GEM compared to patients who went to upfront surgery. However, there's in benefit with increase of progression-free survival and uh, time to failure for treatment. What about on the adjuvant setting? Since 1985, we know that adjuvant therapy for pancreatic cancer have a benefit. In this trial, the JET-SIG trial, patients who have observation have the median survival of 10 months, while patients who have chemo radiation therapy with 5-FU have a median survival of 21 months. So this proof of the concept that adjuvant therapy increased survival for pancreatic cancer patients. ISPAC-1 trial was published in 2004, where it showed that patients who have um, chemotherapy with 5-FU have an overall or median overall survival of 20 months compared to the observation arm, which have a 15 months. This trial was followed by ISPAC-4 trial, 
in this trial, they try to compare gemcitabine as a monotherapy compared to gemcitabine with capcitabine for six cycle each. And they found that for gemcitabine by itself, the median overall survival is 25 months compared to the 28 months when gemcitabine and capcitabine. And this has been like the standard of care till we have the new trial, the PRODIJ24, that was presented in 2018 uh, in ASCO. In this trial, patients who have R0 or R1 or resected pancreatic cancer were randomized to modified fulfurinox compared to gemcitabine monotherapy. Patients were treated with six months of either treatment and a CT scan was done every three months. Interestingly, in this trial, the median overall survival for modified fulfurinox in the adjuvant setting was found to be around 55 months compared to 35 months of gemcitabine. And that was actually a practice changing and all patients who can tolerate fulfurinox have been receiving fulfurinox since then. What about on the palliative setting? As I mentioned earlier, fulfurinox or gemcitabine with nap exhale have been the standard of care after like 2010 and 2014, after the approval of both medication. The median overall survival ranged from eight to 12 months with a BFS of six months. However, for certain population who have germline mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2, which is around four to seven percent. Those patients are known to have a benefit from platin-based therapy. And there was like a trial that's been conducted to see if those patients can benefit from targeting a uh, PAR pathway in a maintenance fashion. This actually was addressed in phase three polo trial where patients who have it treated on a, on a palliative setting who are treated with first line platinum therapy and have like a stable disease, were randomized to have a placebo or oliparp, which is 300 milligram PID. And the study was conducted to look for a progression-free survival as, as an endpoint, a primary endpoint. And interesting enough, patients who receive um, oliparp have a median progression survival of 7.4 months compared to 3.8 months for the patient who receive a placebo. So this is actually um, the, the changes in the management of pancreatic cancer on those subpatient population. So what about the future direction? As we noticed, you know, there's not much of, of targeted therapy, there's not much of uh, immunotherapy had been presented earlier. So historically, pancreatic cancer had been known to be a cancer with no clear actionable molecular mutation. It's known also for a dense uh, dysmoplastic inner stroma that make it a challenge to treat pancreatic cancer. And it's also believed to be a bully immunogenic tumor. So each of these characteristics have been an area of interest for research. Some therapy been targeted for tumor cells, others they've been trying to target the stroma, and others, including the immunotherapy system, has been an interest given that the success of immunotherapy on other cancers. As I presented earlier, targeting tumor cells or actionable mutation have shown that there's an elortinib, which is approved in the first line setting, and oliparp that's approved in the maintenance setting. And that's it as far as targeting tumor cells with um, uh, targeted therapy or uh, tumor cells targeted therapy, basically. Other trials are in the pathway for developing other targets. And this is an area of interest. However, we, so far, the only thing that's approved and show benefit is PARP pathway targeting with PARP inhibitors. Targeting a stroma has been an interest and there's multiple pathways have been targeted uh, using different uh, um, antibodies, uh, small molecules. 
some of these, or actually most of these, has been failed at different stage of their clinical development. The one that's standing out, actually, and reach phase three trial is targeting uh, hyaluronic acid by using a human uh, recombinant hyaluronidase enzyme. The concept of this is that by targeting hyaluronic acid, you decrease interstitial pressure and that allow this collapsed blood vessel to expand and allowing delivery of more of chemotherapy and the hope to have a better response to chemotherapy by modulating the stroma. In a HALO 202 trial, this is a phase two trial where patient was treated with gem abroxane or gem abroxane plus the big PH2O, which is the hyaluronic uh, acid targeting agent, hyaluronidase enzyme. And the initial data actually showed there's a, an improve in the progression free survival for patients who have high hyaluronic acid in their tumor. So this phase two data was encouraging and leading to a phase three trial. The HALO 109-301, the phase three trial, using the same concept on uh, HALO 202, where patients were randomized, around 500 patients, to receive gem abroxane or gem abroxane with the hyaluronic acid targeting agent. Unfortunately, there's, this is, was a negative um, a trial where there's no improvement in the median overall survival when we're comparing the two regimen, gemabroxane alone or gemabroxane plus the hyaluronic acid targeting agent. So this REACH phase three, unfortunately, was there was a lot of hope around this trial, uh, but they didn't make it. The last part, when I'm trying to keep it, you know, um, short for the 20 minute of the talk, is targeting immune system. The initial trial that's exploring the using uh, checkpoint inhibitors have shown a promising data on non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, and renal cell cancer. If you notice in the same paper, when New England Jordan, uh, New, New England Journal of Medicine in the 2012, they highlight that pancreatic cancer was not, uh, there was no objective response on this patient population. So since then, the multiple trials have been trying to target immune therapy or using immune therapy to target the immune system or modulating the immune system on in pancreatic cancer. There is so far, there's no success or a practice changing, if you will, trial. However, there's in the pipeline, there's multiple drugs that try to target the, the checkpoint inhibitors or using vaccine or using CAR T cells or modulation of the immune, uh, immune, um, immune system and the microenvironment of the pancreatic uh, cancer tissue. However, so far, there is no strong data to be presented. However, hoping that in the future, we might have some, some, some data to present in the immunotherapy in pancreatic cancer. I would like to keep it short and give some time for discussion. Uh, with that, I will open the door for um, question and discussion. Thank you, Professor Mann, for this interesting presentation, uh, concise to the point. Um, so I ask that in these, um, if they have any question, just to send to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Dr. Um, Ahmed Abdelazid, Professor of uh, Surgery at Ain Shams University, who wants to ask a question. So, Dr. Ahmed, uh, please, uh, you can ask the question, please. He might be muted. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, can you send me the question? Yes. 
I received the question. Uh, uh, you can send me the question, please, Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Asma. Send me the question and I'll present. Uh, Dr. Mann, uh, the first question is from Dr. Ahmed Ali. Uh, uh, he's from Zagazik University. He's asking about evaluation after new adjuvant. What is the best modality to evaluate response after new adjuvant therapy? That's a very good question, actually. And uh, evaluation for response after new adjuvant actually should be on in a series of a CT scan uh, with pancreatic protocol. So we, we usually base decision not on only one scan, after the initial treatment, uh, we reach it in a series of scans. So after like, you know, having two months or three months of treatment, then reevaluate. We can send uh, another uh, two months of treatment. It can be either chemotherapy or chemo radiation. So this is option. The trend that we have in our practice here is we give systemic chemotherapy. We evaluate with a CT scan. Then we give uh, another systemic or chemo radiation and you evaluate for another scan. And by that time, you can have an idea about the tumor biology and if this patient is really a good candidate for surgery or not. In average, 30% will downstate to resectable. And, uh, but CT scan, back to your question, is, is the best way with pancreatic cancer protocol. So you don't think that PET scan have a, a big role in pancreatic tumors? If you're suspecting, you know, a metastasis or you suspecting a lesion in the liver that you want to address before proceeding with surgery, uh, then a PET scan might be. But you know, if, if you're looking for a susceptibility um, uh, apartment to or close to the blood vessels that you look for a resection margin, uh, then a CT scan will give you a better resolution and the surgeon like to with, with the bronchitic protocol where they can know their margins if it's going to be positive or negative or they know their, their field of resection. But PET scan, definitely, if there is a question mark about possible lymph node distant, or then that's above one centimeter. Anything below one centimeter is hard to detect on, on PET. If it is above one centimeter on CT scan, then uh, PET CT scan will be um, a good uh, modality to review, rule in or rule out this meds. We have a question from one of the hepatopilia researchers, Dr. Ahmed Abrazik, professor at Ancient University. He is asking on uh, the clinical practice, clinical scenarios, we don't see satisfying rate of conversion for borderline tumors. As presented in the presentation, we have a, conversion, a high conversion rate. But in the clinical practice, he is not seeing these rates. I, I would agree. It is, it is very. And actually, the data... Um... I have this very good question. I have the same question when I present similar data elsewhere. The question was actually some, it's in practice, uh, some institution have a better response than others. It also depend on the practice of the institution. What is the, the what the modality of the new adjuvant? Is it uh, fulfurinox for two months or it is some other therapy? In, in average, actually, it's the data that's presented, they say 30%. Uh, this is some data like no presented elsewhere. It might be less because the aggressiveness of this disease and the biology of this disease vary. So I, I would say even what we think initially it's uh, resectable, some after, while they are in an adjuvant therapy, new adjuvant therapy, you find disease progression. So this is not uncommon in pancreatic cancer. And sometimes you end up with seeing a metastasis. So the resectability on those data or this trial it can be local or it can be like a new spots in the liver that were not seen. And now it's appear when repeat CT scan. So it, it is very, this is um, a good question. It's, I would say like the biology of the disease and the practice. Are we including only chemotherapy systemic or are we including systemic plus chemo radiation? Yes, yes. Uh, another question from uh, Dr. Hussein Miki uh, from uh, Sudan. He's asking about in the palliative setting, um, 
what about adding oxaliplatin to uh, gemcitabine? Do you prefer to, to do this or? No. If, if, you know, if I want to use oxaliplatin, I will use it with 5 FU. Uh, even even uh, if you look on the third line treatment, uh, the onivide, which is nal iri, uh, patient the benefit, which is the category one uh, data, patient benefit from uh, oxaliplatin plus 5 FU after the failing gem. There is no uh, strong data about using gemcitabine with oxaliplatin. I, I will not say this is not a good practice, but I would say like we're lacking strong data on that regard. Gem had been um, in the sitting with aproxane, and we always see oxaliplatin with 5-FU, even in the third line sitting with nal iri. Uh, my, my apology, I mean nal iri, this is a different scenario. Uh, and in the third setting, if you do including nal iri with 5 of you, you can use Folfax for patient who can tolerate Folfurinax above front. For some patient, we use gemabroxane as a first line because not everybody is fit for Folfurinax. When we try to go for the second line, then I would say like no 5 of you uh, with can or 5 of you oxaliplatin can be another option. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, I have another question. Actually, it is one question from two different doctors, Dr. Saha from Egypt Air Hospital and Dr. Ahmed from Zagazik University. They have patients with a strange rare pathology, which is squamous cell carcinoma histology in the pancreas. So they're asking about how, how we can manage this strange um, rare uh, histology in the pancreas. This is an interesting, and actually there is uh, some data about you know, uh, the molecular profiling of pancreatic cancer. We know that you know, pancreatic cancer, the location, there's some data that's been published, the location of the disease matter. But when they look further on this, the location, they found actually the histology and the molecular profiling matter because the molecular profile might be uh, some um, squamous features. Those usually are challenging to treat, but those with the squamous feature, including radiation, might be an, a good uh, strategy and, and to include in their regimen. Uh, definitely those patients when we have such weird histology, always good to have molecular profile and look further for actionable mutation if they have a BDL1. Uh, we have patients who had, you know, um, BDL1 staining that is like 20%, 10 to, 10 to 15 or 20%. And they have some response actually, uh, and they are MSI stable, and they have some response to immunotherapy. So those, those patients and those histology can be more aggressive than what's adenocarcinoma that we used to treat. And these are the adenocarcinoma that's are on the trails. We didn't have much data on the other histology or the squamous, but those, with, they should have molecular profile done to them and further characterize them. But with the squamous, with including, you know, um, the radiation might be beneficial. Uh, if the patient is metastatic, has a squamous and metastatic, so radiation will be of minimal rule. So you prefer uh, a specific chemotherapy protocol in this situation? Uh, cisplatin based will be like a good regimen, given that, you know, our knowledge about, you know, squamous and cisplatin, you know, the regimen. Uh, so you're referring to somebody, uh, are we dealing with cancer of unknown primary? Because we have, I, I published case reports and actually, we had some uh, not typical metastasis to the pancreas that came from elsewhere. So I would say like, if you see this, it might wanna consider cancer of unknown primary and you wanna do a little bit more of evaluation. Okay, uh, we have another question from uh, Professor Maya Zedin from Ancham University. Uh, if we have patient with poor performance status, uh, ECOG-3 or it's better to not to treat, or if you are going to treat, which protocol you will use? You said performance status of three? Yes. Th this is a good question. And actually there is um, data been shown that is performance status of pancreatic cancer uh, influence the outcome. And selection of a treatment really can either improve or basically worsen the outcome. So with those patients with performance status of, of a three, I would say monotherapy with gem might be a safe way to go. Uh, and we, if we are looking only for a palliative, some patient, you know, if, if pain has been an issue for them or the local, you know, we know pancreatic cancer 
with splint plexus being affected, pain is, is a major issue there. Sometimes we include upfront radiation with, with Zelora to have some palliative control. And if it is a local advance, uh, gemcitabine monotherapy is, is appropriate. Um, that's, I would say, like the, the safest way to go with those with BS3. Um, I think uh, we finished with all the questions sent uh, to us. Uh, thank you, Professor Mann, uh, for uh, this nice meeting and this nice discussion. Um, and I hope we have future collaboration, inshallah, and we have you again in our uh, uh, educational sessions, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad, and uh, thank you again for having me. It was a pleasure, and I enjoyed the discussion with the group. Uh, best of luck. Thank you, sir. Ah, take care. Have a good day. Thank you all that is, and uh, you are welcome to join us, inshallah, in the future meetings. Look Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Assalamu alaikum.